All right, everyone. Well, it's six o'clock. So uh, why don't we get started? It's good to see so many faces here on my screen. Looks like we got 48 devices connected right now and some should still be coming, but good to see everybody. I'm a bit dark here tonight on the screen, but changed <laughs> from where I usually am. But um, yeah, I'm going to just open up in a word of prayer. And uh, there was a, a handout that was sent out uh, to your emails. If you didn't get it, I'll put it in the chat just after I pray and hand it over to Dr. Haken. So let's let's go to the Lord in prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this opportunity for us to connect tonight once again here on Zoom for this class on Baptist history. Lord, we pray for Dr. Haken tonight that uh, you would speak through him and that you would encourage us through him and uh, yeah, that we would just be challenged once again um, in our own walk with you by uh, looking to the past and uh, some faithful men and women that we can learn from about what they, how they uh, thought of you, how they um, interacted with you in, in their day and time. And uh, again, may we learn much tonight uh, and not only mm -hmm. learn, but then seek to apply as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's great to be with you uh, again. And uh, tonight we're going to be thinking about uh, the doctrine of the Trinity and uh, particular uh, an, an author named John Gill. Uh, some of you may know the name. Um, he probably was the most important Baptist theologian uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, by, this, by the early 18th century, there were Baptist churches in the British Isles, um, England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, probably in the vicinity of around 220. Uh, that's actually a fairly firm figure by 1715. And there were about 25 in what would become the United States <clears throat> in that string of colonies running along the Atlantic seaboard. <clears throat> um, all of those colonies at this point in time are part of the British world, British empire, if you want to describe it that way. And so there's about 250 Baptist churches, some of them um, fairly small, 30, 40 people, members, uh, some of them larger, maybe 200, 300 in terms of membership. Um, nearly all of them in small rural, rural contexts, uh, villages, hamlets, small towns. Uh, and then about 25 or so centered in the capital of this world. And you might thinking, well, capital of the, you know, the colonies in America. Well, yes, their capital was London. And um, uh, London was about half a million people. It's a huge urban uh, conurbation. Um, and by the end of the 18th century, London would be the largest city in the world, a million people. And um, at the beginning of the 18th century, which is really, really where our story begins, as I said, it's about half a million people. Uh, the next largest town in Britain is Norwich, we have a town in Ontario over near Woodstock called, we, Canadians call it Norwich, uh, which I gather is the way you, you should pronounce it in Ontario, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. But if you ever go to England and you see the name spelt, it's not Norwich, it's Norwich. Uh, the W is almost silent. And it was the next largest town and it was around 10,000 people. So you think about that. Um, the vast majority of the population at the beginning of the 18th century in the British Isles is uh, rural. Uh, you have um, uh, the population total is about maybe eight or nine million, maybe 10 million. And so about a, about a 16th of the population lives in London. The rest of them are live in small towns, very small villages and hamlets. And so their Baptist churches are going to likewise be relatively small. It's also gonna mean that most of the Baptist pastors in this period are bivocational. Their congregations cannot finance them. They can't support them. And you know, when you, we think about our congregation and uh, we're blessed in quite a number of ways, but one of them is just the blessing of having a, uh, um, a group of elders uh, who serve as pastors vocationally uh, that 
is not the norm when you go back into the period we're looking at at all. John Gill, who we'll look at, um, born in 1697, he would die in 1771. Uh, he was supported by his congregation. His congregation had about 150 members and they were able to financially support him. He never had an assistant pastor. Near the end of his life, um, there's a lot of anecdotes about him, some of which are quite fun. Uh, near the end of his life, he, he was getting older in years and uh, not always able to carry on the preaching and counseling ministry. And so the, the elders in the church, who are not vocational elders, they were uh, lay, lay people, but they had been appointed as elders, they suggested, why don't we appoint an assistant pastor? Well, Gill's response to that about a week later was he said, I, I read through the New Testament this past week, and I couldn't find anybody in the New Testament called an assistant pastor. Uh, I think we'll just go with me as the pastor. Uh, I'm not sure what his fears were, but they never did appoint an assistant during his day. Um, so the idea that, you know, the, 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 the way in which we uh, uh, experience church with a body of pastors is just a tremendous blessing that many Baptist churches in times gone by did not have. Um, let me say a little bit about the general period that we call the 18th century, and then I want to talk about this issue of the doctrine of Trinity, and then I want to focus on Gill. So I hope I can get through all I need to today. Uh, there should be um, a handout. Um, there's two or three of those texts which aren't easy reading. So uh, I hope to guide us through those, those texts in a minute. Um, by the early 18th century, uh, persecution had ended. Uh, in 1688, the Dutch uh, prince, William of Orange, had come over to England in a almost bloodless coup d'etat and removed his father-in-law, James II, who went into exile to France, uh, where he lived with uh, at the court of Louis XIV, the Sun King, who was his cousin. And um, France and England being at war with each other, the French financed three attempted invasions of England over the next 60 years. Uh, one in the 16, uh, late 1680s, one in 1715, and then the most famous one in 1745 when the grandson of James II, known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, <laughs> he, really, he really wasn't that Bonnie, an individual, uh, tried to take back the throne for the House of Stuart. But um, that needn't concern us at this point. Um, I may touch on all that a bit later, um, not tonight. And um, William of Orange had come over and he had grown up in a world of religious toleration. Uh, Holland was a center of commerce, of wealth, of tremendous uh, uh, painting. Um, one of my favorite artists, uh, Vermeer, uh, lived through this period is absolutely fabulous art. And one of the joys of when I, my wife and I went to Amsterdam was seeing uh, some of his pictures, paintings in the, uh, the Rijksmuseum. Uh, just a tremendous um, artist. Uh, Rembrandt is probably the most famous uh, in this period. And um, uh, it had also been, uh, Holland was also a center of religious toleration. And so William of Orange brought with him these ideas. He secured passage through the Houses of Parliament of an act called the Act of Toleration in 1688. And uh, that is at the ground of our liberties that we have uh, to gather like this uh, without fear. Uh, obviously we're in the middle of a, a challenging time, but um, at the heart of our liberties as Canadian citizens is this foundational liberty of religious liberty. And um, it, it's an issue that is of, I think, great concern, um, but again, we need to, to move on. Um, and so the Baptist churches in the period we're looking at by and large had 
were free from persecution. But the 18th century is also a period which we call the age of reason. And in the, in the late 17th century, a number of intellectuals in Europe, uh, particularly in Cambridge and Oxford, began to think about all of the religious turmoil that had gripped Europe from the Reformation through to the middle of the 17th century. There had in fact been a, a thing called the Thirty Years War from 1618 to 1648. Um, it was an absolutely devastating war in Europe. Um, it convulsed most of the European nations. Um, it was the last war that the Sweden, we know Sweden as a completely neutral country, never engaged in any wars in the 20th century. Uh, they were a major player in that war. Uh, Germany, large parts of Germany were simply burned to the ground. And it was a war between Protestants and Catholics. Uh, the Protestant Swedes, Protestant Germans fighting against the Catholics in Germany, and then Spanish Catholics and um, uh, French Catholics. And uh, it was a war in which there was very little quarter given. Towns were sacked, burned to the ground, men and women mercilessly slain. In fact, it was after that war that European nations began to enact various policies about what you can do in war and what you can't do in war. And those policies basically survived until the First World War. The 20th century has actually seen a, we've gone back to the sort of brutality that characterized say the 17th century before these uh, rules were put in place or the ancient world. Um, war is an unfortunate feature of life, and um, there are things that we, you, there is a whole development of a thought called just war in how to fight wars, and the 20th century, those things have been completely thrown out the window, but again, that's another story. Um, the, uh, a number of these intellectuals began to think, you know, what caused all these wars? And they came to the wrong conclusion, it was the Bible. And they began to try to construct a way of thinking about life, uh, everything about life, um, politics, biology, um, how to run the family, how to educate children, in which the preeminent factor was human reason. In other words, can we construct a society in which at the foundation of our society is human reason? A number of these intellectuals believed that because every human being has a mind and has a reasoning power, the, the ideas that they would come up with would be universal. They'd be true for every people, whether they're in Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America, as we call it now, wherever they are, these European, this European model of how to construct society would be true for everybody. And uh, this position is technically known as rationalism. And it's a very influential position. In fact, we're still living in it. We're still living in this experiment. Let's, 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 let's assume that truth can only be found ultimately by human reason. What, what kind of things can we find out? Well, as we've seen in the past 300 years, we found out all kinds of stuff by the use of human reason. You know, the nature of the universe, elements of the solar system. It's this, it's this perspective that leads to the, to the re recognition that, that the solar system um, is not going around the earth, but actually we're part of a group of planets that go around the sun. Uh, the late medieval view was that the, the earth is the center of the entire universe and everything revolves around the earth and science has shown us, no, that's not the way it is. Um, uh, the, the sort of discoveries we've made in medicine, the advances we've made in uh, transportation up until the 1830s, the fastest anybody could go was as fast as your two legs would carry you <laughs> and a horse. 
And then suddenly the Western technology invented the train. When Queen Victoria took the train, she was horrified. The train was going around 25 miles an hour. And she was absolutely scared witless. And she, 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 she actually passed a law, at least for her, that, that whenever she was on the train, she, it could never go more than 30 miles an hour. And um, I mean, the, the invention of uh, photography, um, the discovery of germs through microscopes, I mean, all of this is part of the, what we call the rational revolution, et cetera. But it also has a devastating impact upon biblical truth. So it's not surprising that a number of key elements of Christianity begin to be questioned because they don't accord with human reason. And the first one is the Trinity. And during the 18th century, there was a huge battle. And we don't have time to go into all the details of that. A huge battle over the doctrine of the Trinity. It lasted most of the 18th century. And some denominations yielded to their culture. And if you remember right at the beginning of our time together, I specified that there were two groups of Baptists. There were the general Baptists who are largely Arminian theologically. That is, they believed in the emphasis on the freedom of the human will, and you could lose your salvation. And then there were the particular Baptists who sometimes are described as Calvinistic, and they emphasize the sovereignty of God in saving sinners, and that you cannot lose, a genuine believer cannot lose their salvation. Most of the Baptist churches today come from the particular Baptists, and there's a, real, there's a reason why. Because in the 18th century, pretty well the entire denomination of general Baptists yielded to rationalism. They allowed ministers to be ordained who could not affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. They affirmed believers baptism, but they didn't affirm the Trinity. I mean, I've always found that sort of thing bonkers. I mean, Believer's baptism is important, but it's a second order truth. There are certain, and this is, this is where, let me just take it, let me take one little uh, side pathway. Uh, there are uh, probably about a dozen theological truths that are absolutely, utterly foundational. And if you don't believe them, you're just not a Christian. However zealous and moral you might be, however much you say you love the Bible, you're not a Christian. Um, if you don't believe in the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian. If you don't believe in the incarnation, that in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, you have fully man and fully God, you're not a Christian. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead bodily, you're not a Christian. If you don't believe in that future resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, you're not a Christian. Justification by faith alone, that we are saved not by faith plus we grew up in a Christian home, faith plus I'm a member of a Baptist church, faith plus I've had ex experiences, uh, faith plus works. No, no, it is faith alone. Now, faith is never alone. It always issues and works. But you read Galatians 1. If anybody comes to you, preaches another gospel than I preach to you, let him be anathema. And one of these foundational doctrines is the Trinity. And um, we'll see how Gill argues that. And again, <laughs> this is a huge subject. It's a difficult subject. Um, it is absolutely, utterly, totally foundational to our faith. And I sometimes ask students in my classes, so, so in my introductory church history class, where we actually spend a lot of time looking at the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, I usually, uh, I have about a hundred students and I ask them, uh, this is at Southern, how many of you have uh, ever heard a sermon on the Trinity? And it's very revealing. And I might get four people put up their hand. Now, most of these people are somewhere between the ages of 25 and 40. They've spent their lives, many of them, in the church. 
They've heard two sermons a week for like 25 years. And I, I began to realize over the past 10, 15 years that we assume people believe the Trinity. But we don't preach it. At least the broad, I'm talking here broadly about evangelicalism. And I think that's very deeply disturbing, especially because I think our great theological challenge in the coming years is going to be Islam. And um, I've been spending time reading about the growth of Islam in my father's homeland, Iraq and Persia and Afghanistan in the seven, eight hundreds. And the way in which a some professing Christians capitulated to Islam. And one of the reasons was Islam was so simple. Just believe in God. Don't have to worry about three persons, one God, and how these three persons are all God. Just believe in God. It's a really simple message. One God, one prophet. Christianity, I, I, I don't mean any disrespect here, but this might come across as very disrespectful and very politically incorrect, but Christianity is a religion for people who think. In some ways, Islam is for dummies. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm I'm being I'm being, I, I please understand me in the context and you can push back tell me that's not an appropriate way but it's simple you know just one god no persons are in the godhead and muhammad is a prophet christianity we believe in three persons yet they're one god not three three gods somehow they share the same being yet they are three persons and the second person of the Godhead became a man and died. And he's fully God. When, I, when those men and women who saw our blessed Lord in the flesh, they were in the presence of the eternal son of God. And yet he was fully man. <laughs> How is that? I mean, this is a very, a Christianity is a very difficult faith. In, in some ways, intellectually. And um, uh, it's not surprising to me that some people, as the Islam grew in the, the centuries after the appearance of Muhammad, opted for that. Rationalism says the same thing. If there is a God, how can three plus three equal one? Uh, Joseph Priestley, who was a ma major rationalist in this period, he was also a Presbyterian minister but had given up his faith. Uh, very interesting figure. Um, he discovered oxygen. He's also the person, next time you have a soft drink, you are to thank him for it because he, he invented carbonated water. Um, I don't normally have soft drinks, so I don't have to thank Joseph Priestley for uh, my beverages. I normally have tea. But um, Priestley said once, it's pretty simple. One plus one plus one equals three, not one. So there's no way the Doctrine of Trinity can be right. Uh, brilliant as he was, there's a, that's flawed because each of the persons of the Godhead is infinite. So infinity plus infinity doesn't equal three infinities. <laughs> it's just infinity. Um, the age of reason then brought into the the life of the church, major challenges. And you know, it's still playing out its course. Uh, one, of the great, uh, one of the great tragedies of the 20th century in Canada is the apostasy, and I'm not, that I will not back off on, of the United Church. In the 1960s, the United Church probably comprised somewhere around two thirds of professing Christians in Ontario. When it entered into union in 1925, the entirety of Methodism pretty well, except for a few free Methodists, and then about half of the Presbyterian denomination at the time, that was around 70% of professing evangelicals in Ontario went into the United Church. In the 1960s, the leadership in the church, both denominationally headquarters in Toronto and the colleges determined basically to give up inerrancy of the Bible and critical questions like the, the incarnation, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, 
there were various reasons for this, but they basically bowed to the pressure of our culture, which says that the incarnation, not rational. How do I, virgin birth, how can a, a virgin give birth? Uh, the Trinity, not rational, doesn't accord to my human reason. And these things were given up. So the effects of the, the uh, age of reason, you can see it right here in Ontario. Um, one of the things I've loved over the last 25, 30 years is traveling to little Baptist churches and speaking on occasion in these churches and uh, going through all these little towns in Ontario, like Listowel and Harriston and Port Elgin and Goderich and on and on and on. And everyone has a United Church and they're big. And I bet you bottom dollar, the vast majority of them have got 25, 30 people in there all over the age of 60 to 70 and they're dying. And because of the abandonment of the heart of the gospel, Christians can differ over issues like baptism, church governance. You give up the Trinity, you've lost the coals of orthodoxy and there can be no piety. So the figure who is most instrumental in keeping the Baptist, the particular Baptist on the straight and narrow was John Gill. And a bit later in the, uh, the, this course of lectures, I'll talk about the way in which Gill had one area of teaching that was not helpful. He didn't believe in the free offer of the gospel. That is the urging of men and women indiscriminately and children to put their faith in Christ. And we'll get to that. But he was a very, as, as Augustus Toplady, the author of Rock of Ages, cleft for me, said after his death, he was the great and good Dr. Gill. He was a great theologian. And the more I've studied him, the more I'm thankful to God that he had such a man at such a time in the 18th century who, who made it a fundamental that the doctrine of the Trinity was absolutely bedrock and the Baptist would not shift on that. Let me talk a little bit about his life and then I'll look at the Trinity, his teaching. We have portraits of him from his latter years and let me pull those up. Um, here is Gil. This is Gil probably in his forties. Um, he has the, the wig, he's bewigged, and he's got the collar, if you remember that from last week. Um, this is the more famous Gill picture, though. This is from, he's probably at this point in his 60s, uh, not long, he died at 74, so not long before his death. And um, it's a very nice picture. It's based on a painting that hangs today in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London in the uh, study of the pastor, Peter Masters. And it's a huge portrait, measures probably about five feet in length by about three feet wide. And this, this kind of print was made from that uh, painting. So Gill was born in 1697. Um, he was born in the heart of England uh, at a place called Kettering. Uh, K-E-T-T-E-R-I-N-G, Kettering. And Kettering was a town of about 4,000 when he was born there. It was a market town. That is, it was a town that on, um, on Wednesday afternoon and Saturdays, people would come to buy their produce and uh, merchants and artisans would go to the town to sell their products. There's still a lot of towns like this that have a Saturday market. Um, the last time I was in England, we went the people I was with, we went to a, a little market town called Olney on a Saturday. And it was fabulous, all these local craftsmen and so on. And so he grew up in this uh, context. He was a very precocious child. And his father was a woolen merchant, Edward Gill. And he was a Baptist deacon. And uh, the only school in the town, the headmaster of the school was an Anglican. And when Gill was around 11, the headmaster came to see Edward Gill and told him two things. Number one, your son is really making great progress in learning languages. Um, he's really doing well in Latin. He's, got, he's, he's on his way in Greek. And uh, 
he said number two things. Number one, he said, I've really been getting, I've been getting some pressure from the local minister. All the children have to go to morning prayer at the Anglican church for them to continue in the school. And he said, I, I really encourage you to send young John to the Anglican church for morning prayer. No big deal. And he said, in fact, why don't you become Anglicans? If you become Anglicans, I will personally pay for John to go to Oxford. Now, this is a world in which 2% of men, no women, 2% of men, if that, go to Oxford and Cambridge. I mean, he was offering him a scholarship that was a very, very, very rare. But it meant they'd have to give up being Baptist. There were people in this period who did that. John Wesley's mother and father were raised Presbyterians outside the Church of England, and they re, they, the, two, the two children, uh, Susanna Wesley, John Wesley's mother, uh, Susanna Ansley was her maiden name, and Samuel Wesley rejoined the Church of England because they realized if they stayed Presbyterian, there was no future for them socially. But Gill's parents said, no, there's absolutely no way we can do that. Where we believe that Baptist convictions, uh, we don't believe in the idea of the state church. No, thank you. And so Gill was pulled out of school at twelve, and he worked with his father in the in a woolen in a woolen uh, manufactory. But he continued his studies, and by the age of nineteen, um, when he was converted, uh, by the age of nineteen, he had mastered Latin, Greek, and taught himself Hebrew. Uh, he must have had a real gift for languages because by the time he's in his 30s, he's also taught himself Syriac Arabic as well as French, German, Italian, and maybe a couple more languages. I mean, he was, he was brilliant in languages and loved, loved books and loved learning. And uh, he is converted uh, in 1716, baptized. He actually writes a hymn for his baptism. Um, he was baptized as 95% of Baptists were in that period in a river. And as he's baptized in the river, the congregation apparently sang uh, the hymn he had composed. And a week later, he joined the Baptist church in Kettering. Now, you might remember, remember this town because when we come to the, my favorite theologian from this period, Andrew Fuller, uh, he was a pastor in Kettering. So we'll, we'll come back to this uh, later. Um, when he was baptized, he was asked the following week, uh, well, he joined the church, and then that evening, they asked him to speak on a passage in Isaiah at the church. And people were amazed at how good he was. He had never spoken before. And the church asked him to, to speak a number of times, and eventually, what the Baptist church did in Kettering, and there were two ways of ordaining men. They'd ordain a man, a pastor of the church, and then sometimes what they did was they, they recognized the man had gifts and they set a man apart to preach the word wherever God led him. That was the wording. And they did that to Gil. They recommended that Gil go and study with a man named John Davis in a nearby village uh, for a year. And John Davis was supposed to help him develop theologically. Uh, Gil would remember the time with, with both um, thankfulness and regret. Regret because it was a complete waste of time. John Davis didn't help him one iota, apparently. But thankfulness because he met his wife there at this little Baptist church uh, nearby, uh, Elizabeth Negus, N-E-G-U-S. And um, we don't have time to look at this. I am going to look at Baptist marriage a little later in the term. I want to look at Samuel Pierce. But uh, Gil had a fabulous marriage. And when his wife became bedridden as she was for probably the last 15 years of his life. Uh, he was able to convince his son-in-law, a man named George Keith, we'll come across him in a minute, to buy the house next to them. It was a row housing and to knock out the wall on the second floor so that they had a continuous room running two houses on the same floor. So when Gil was out at the church, uh, his daughter, Mrs. Keith, could simply walk, right? Walk from their house, same floor, 
into their house and take care of his wife. It was in bed on the second floor. She couldn't get downstairs. And she probably didn't come downstairs for the last 15 years of her life. And so his son-in-law, uh, George Keith and his wife, Mary, uh, Mary Gill, uh, bought the house next door, knocked out the adjoining wall and built this kind of uh, common room. And they could, walk, they could walk into the house without going outside. If it was on clement weather, even if it was only a few steps, they could just uh, cross into the house. And uh, there's been one or two articles done on his, on Gill's marriage, um, one by a woman named Sharon James, which is a really, I, I had no idea and she did research on it. And you just, it's very, very touching about his love uh, for his wife in her latter years when she was very severely incapacitated. Uh, in many ways, this was the making of Gill. Um, it enabled him to be the writer he did because his wife uh, took care of the home while she was able, and then his daughter uh, later. They would have three children. <clears throat> they would have a son, uh, uh, Mary Gill, who married George Keith. He was a, a printer. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then Elizabeth Gill, who died at the age of 13. And um, one of the earliest things I read about of Gill's was his funeral sermon for his daughter. At the end of which he has a uh, he has a little memoir, which wasn't given at the time of the funeral. He preached her funeral sermon, and he actually hardly got through it for weeping. It's a very very touching sermon, and I'd heard a lot about Gill as a crusty theologian, and this gave me a whole different picture of him. Uh, she died. It's very interesting. She died in May of 1738, about three days before the conversion of John Wesley, about a mile away from where she died. It's interesting when you compare these little things, because I remember looking at the date of her death and thinking, oh, John Wesley was converted three days later, about a mile away. Uh, Gill knew Wesley. They didn't get along at all. <laughs> they wrote books against each other on the issues of Calvinism. So uh, Gill had started preaching and um, his, his word came of him uh, to, to London. Uh, there was a church in London that had been pastored by a man named Benjamin Keach, very important church. I mentioned Keach last week, if you remember, right? The hymn singing. And Keach had died in 1704 and he'd been succeeded by his son-in-law, Benjamin Stinton, S-T-I-N-T-O-N. And Benjamin Stinton was pastor for about 15 years and then died very suddenly. And the church was vacant for about two years. And word got to the church that there was this young man in Kettering. Kettering is about today, it's about three hours drive from London. In those days, it would be probably about two days on a coach. The young man, it was, seemed to have great gifts. And so they invited Gill to come down and he came on what they call probation. And I forget the length of time, but it usually would be about six months, which meant the church didn't call Gill. Uh, they, they, they were basically trying him out for six months. And if at the end of six months, they thought, no, it's not gonna work, Gill could leave. If a Gill at the end of six months thought it wasn't gonna work, he could leave. And I, it's an excellent, I think it's personally an excellent way of testing the waters. Um, I still remember a church in our fellowship, a large church in our fellowship. I won't give any more details than that. It's in Southern Ontario. They called a brother from the United States. They'd heard him preach twice. They moved him up at some considerable expense. He lasted six months. And then he told them he didn't think it would work and left. And uh, this would avoid that. You know, many of the number of the churches in this period, the men who became pastors were raised in the church, mentored in the church. So the church knew them. Many of them didn't and would, 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 would bring a man in and he'd be on probation for maybe six months, uh, sometimes a year. Benjamin Bedham, who was a great preacher in this period, was on probation for a year. When they brought Spurgeon in, he was on probation. They told him for six months. And then a week later, they told him three months. And then a week later, they said, just forget it. We're calling you. <laughs> he was, they realized this guy is a, such a gem. No, no, we want him. 
Uh, but normally probation is about six months. And I think there's, I think there's merit in that, but anyway. And so Gill goes to London and uh, the church met on the south side of London in an area of London called Southwark, S-O-U-T-H-W-A-R-K. Again, the W is not pronounced. I mean, one of the beautiful thing, you may not think it's beautiful. I grew up there, so I think it's nice, is English names, town names are so bizarre. You look at them and uh, five, uh, one out of two times, it's not pronounced the way it's spelled. And Southwark is not pronounced, it, the W gets elided. And uh, it's probably the roughest area of London in this period. It's an area where a lot of immigrants would initially come, um, a lot of poverty. And Gill would build his church here. And this is the church that Charles Spurgeon would pastor. And uh, Gill is called in 1719. He's 21. And he stays there till 1771. 50 years. Uh, 52 years. Uh, the next pastor they call, John Rippon, and now I'll turn it in a second to, pro, uh, to, uh, to uh, 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 the Trinity. The next pastor they call was John Rippon. And Rippon came in 1773. He stayed till 1836. So between 1719 and 1836, they had two pastors. That's 119 years. Man, if you didn't like, <laughs> you didn't like either of them, you were sunk. You'd have to leave. Uh, <clears throat> um, pretty early on, Gill realized there were a, a number of attacks on the Trinity. There was a church in London where one of the ministers came out and said uh, he didn't think the Trinity was a biblical concept. It was dreamed up by philosophers in the third or fourth century in the church. Not helpful. Uh, Gill was influential enough to get that church kicked out of the Baptist Association. And rightly so, because that church had gone off of the gospel. If God is not a triune being, we are not saved. If our Lord Jesus Christ is not fully God, the eternal God, we are not saved. We cannot be saved by a creature. And so Gill began to uh, protect his own pulpit. Uh, in the past, in the text I gave, the text I gave you, I'm not going to be able to read them all. But I'm going to jump down to the one of the third one, I believe it is, where it's John Rippon. This is John. Remember, he's the man who comes after Gill. And he writes a memoir of Gill. And he says this about Gill. Dr. Gill not only watched over his people with great affection, fidelity, and love, but he also watched his pulpit. He would not, if he knew it, admit anyone to preach for him who is either cold-hearted to the doctrine of the Trinity. That is very interesting. He would, ask, he, would, he, he would either know or he'd ask. If the person, he didn't know them, and he was away, and the person was filling the pulpit, he would, what do you, what do you think about the doctrine of the Trinity? Or who denied the divine filiation of the Son of God. That is, that the Son of God was eternally generated from the Father, which I'll talk about in a second or who objected to conclude his prayers with the usual doxology to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three equal persons in the one Jehovah. And then he, he, he names, Rippon names three groups he would not admit to the pulpit, Sabellians, Arians, and Sicinians. And probably most of you are thinking, well, <laughs> who on earth are these people? Uh, well, Sabellians are people who deny the distinction of persons. So they would argue that the one who became incarnate was actually the father. There's no distinction between father, son, and spirit. The father became incarnate. Uh, the, the father and the son came down at Pentecost. There is a group today, oneness only Pentecostals, who believe this. Um, there is a famous author. Um, oh, his name slipped me right now, who comes out of this oneness group. Um, but be that as it may. Arians. Arians deny the eternal deity of the Son and the Spirit. They actually argued that the Father created the Son at a certain point, and then the Spirit. 
Jehovah's Witnesses are Arians. In fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Holy Spirit's a force, but they are classical Arians. They deny the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. They actually argue that before uh, the incarnation, our Lord Jesus was an angel, Michael. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, but they are not Christians. They may be zealous as all get out, moral individuals, but they are not Christians. They do not know the living God. I remember being in a conversation one time with a Jehovah's Witness, and I asked him, did he worship Jesus? And he said, uh, yes, he did. And I thought to myself, man, I've got him. And I said to him, if you worship Jesus and you don't believe he's God, which you don't, right? Fully God. No. I said, then you are either guilty of romantic hero worship or you're an idolater because you're worshiping a creature. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, uh, if God told us to worship a stone, we would. And I had, I had no response to that in one sense, because I realized this man has no idea of God. For all of his God talk, he doesn't know the God of Scripture, who says very clearly again and again and again, you shall not worship anything but myself. I will not give my glory to another. It was a very telling moment for me as I really realized that this man, I think, had been in Jehovah's Witnesses for many years. Um, and then Sicinians, they Unitarians. There's a Unitarian Universalist church in Hamilton on Dundurn, uh, just before you hit uh, between Aberdeen and, um, and uh, Main Street. And uh, they, they go back to this period. They might actually go back to a general Baptist church, or they might go back to an English Presbyterian church that basically gave up. They believed in the scriptures, but they gave up the idea of the Trinity. So what you've got there is are Sibelians who are modalists. That's the technical word now for Sibelians. They're modalists. They deny the persons. That's a problem. Who is Jesus praying to in the garden? If it was the father on the cross, how do you make any sense of Hebrews 9, 14? That the son offered himself once to the father by the eternal spirit. There has to be a distinction of persons. And yet there's one God. And we'll, we'll see how Gil talks about that in a second. Arians are Jehovah's Witnesses, really, today. They're the most common group. And Sassinians denied the, the Unitarians. Those three groups he considered as real enemies of the cross of Christ. They dared not ask him to preach, nor could he in conscience permit them to officiate for him. He conceived that by his uni this uniformity of conduct, he adorned the pastoral office. He did that, but he also preserved his denomination. Uh, let me just say a little bit about his publishing. And then I'll, I'll have time to read one of the statements below. Uh, Gill wrote a lot of books. Uh, let me give you a picture of, of uh, one of his major books. And uh, I'm really, I'm wrestling against the clock here because um, uh, there is so much to say about Gill. But here, here's a picture of one of his major, this is his major systematic theology, a body of practical divinity. Notice down here, who printed it? George Keith, his son-in-law. <laughs> he lived right next door to him. <laughs> uh, that's brilliant. Uh, you, got, you got your own son-in-law right next door, printing all your books. Um, I, I, have, I tend to have a fairly prolific pen and that'd be brilliant to have your own printer right next door, you know. It'd be even better today. I just type it out and send it across to him. And anyway, um, most Baptist pastors, all of these things tied together. Most Baptist pastors are not wealthy, bivocational. The average Baptist pastor had a library of about 30 to 40 books. Usually it consisted of a number of books, and then John Gill's Body of Divinity, which was three volumes, 
and then his complete commentary on the Old and New Testaments, which ran to nine volumes. So you think about this. One third of your books is John Gill. He's enormously influential. And uh, let me take one little rabbit trail and then I'll, I will come back to the Trinity. I've been thinking in the 19, late 60s and 70s, I was um, a hardcore Marxist, like many of my generation. And uh, I won't go into details of that, how God saved me out of that. And I'm so thankful for my wife's witness. When I met her in Mother's Pizza, man, I was, I was way, way far away from the kingdom. And I wondered, you know, after my conversion in the 70s and 80s, I wondered what happened to all those people who shared my beliefs? And I think in the last 20, 20 years, I've realized where they ended up, a lot of them. They ended up in universities and uh, media. And they're educating a lot of the, I'm thinking here, particularly the States, but also true here, a lot of the angry young men and women who are now on the left and who are arguing for all kinds of changes regarding things like LGBTQ, uh, transgenderism, because all those, the concepts of those areas were all very familiar to me in the 60s. I mentioned that because of the influence of books and education and how you can shape an entire generation. It's made it very, it's reminded me of the great importance of theological education. <clears throat> why a school like our school like Heritage is so vital and why it has to be supported by our prayers and by our students, by sending students there and by our money. In that, in the period we're looking at in London, there was no Baptist school, but the, the influence of Gill was enormous, absolutely enormous. Usually when two Baptist pastors would get together and they'd have a difference of opinion on a question, one of them, within minutes, one would say, let's see what Gill says. I mean, Gill was so influential. Now, in one area, as we'll look at in about a month, there was a problem. But in this most basic area, he shaped an entire denomination and kept them orthodox. What did he say about the Trinity? Let me look at one text of the ones I've given you. And then we'll have some time for questions. So if you go back to that Baptist testimonies, Baptist statements on the Trinity. Trinitarians assert, this is from his body of divinity, that there is but one divine essence, undivided, common to Father, Son, and Spirit, and in this sense, but one God. Since there is but one essence, though there are different modes of subsisting in it, which are called persons. So there's one God. There's one divine being, and yet the one divine being subsists or exists in three persons. They are all, as he will now say, equally God. These possess the whole essence undivided. That is to say, not that the Father is one part, the Son another, and the Holy Spirit a third, but as the whole fullness of the Godhead dwells in the Father, so in the Son, who has all the Father has. John 15, 16. Jesus says, all that the Father has, I have. Does he have omnipotent power? So does the Son. Is he omnibenevolent? So is the Son. Is he omniscient? So is the Son. Is he omnipresent? So is the Son. All the attributes that we say of the Father, the Son has. And likewise, the Holy Spirit. And so in the spirit, and therefore but one God. The, this unity of them is not a unity of testimony only. In other words, it's not that the three agree on everything, but is a unity of nature. They have one and the same infinite and undivided nature. Now, why is this so important? The doctrine of the unity of the divine being is of great importance in religion. By the way, religion is always a positive term pretty well in the 19th century. 
I know for many today, um, it's a negative term, but it's a positive term in that period. It's of great importance in religion, especially in the affair of worship. God, the only God, is the object of it. This is the sense of the first and second commands, which forbid owning any other God but one, and the worship of any creature, whatever, angels or men or any other creature, and the likeness of them, which is to do, which to do is to worship the creature besides or along with, with the creator. But this hinders not, but that the Son and the Spirit may have acts of worship performed to them. In other words, can we worship the Son and the Spirit? <laughs> sure, we have to. They're fully God. Um, <clears throat> uh, hinders not that, that the Son and the Spirit may have acts of worship performed to them, equally as to the Father, and for this reason, because they are with him, the one God. Hence, baptism, he, he cites too, is administered equally in the name of all three, and prayer is jointly made unto them, both solemn acts of religious worship. I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but baptism is an act of worship. And it is in the name, one name, not a singular, one name, one God, of three, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And prayer, Revelation 1, 4 to 5. Um, if you have a Bible there at hand, um, you could turn to it. If not, uh, listen as I read. Where we have a prayer <clears throat> that uh, God might give grace and uh, understanding to the readers of Revelation. Um, we read this in Revelation uh, verse 4. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you. From the one who is, who was, and is to come. That's the Father. And from the seven spirits before the throne. That's the Holy Spirit. The word seven in Revelation, as you know, is the number of perfection. And it's the perfection of the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Uh, we could spend the next two or three hours easily. We're not going to. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't be upset. Going through Trinitarian texts in the New Testament. It's all over the place not just not just a few passages and um <clears throat> notice how he goes on this doctrine serves to fix and settle the object of our faith hope and love without division and distraction of mind which are not to be exercised in different objects and divided between them but are to center in one object the own the one and only true god father son and spirit whom alone we are to make our confidence our hope and the center of our affections Jeremiah 17, 7. If you afterwards read Jeremiah 17, 7, 5 to 8. It is a beautiful passage, especially for our day. Blessed is the man whose hope is fixed on the Lord. And uh, Gil is obviously understanding the word Lord there as the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Now, there's a lot, I've given you a little more uh, than uh, we have time to look at. But I want to be observant of your time. Uh, it's coming up for eight, uh, seven o'clock, and we want to have time for some questions if you have them. But just to sum up, um, <clears throat> uh, Gill um, made this doctrine a central doctrine of his ministry because this is where the battle was. Uh, the last uh, 40, 50 years, we've been fighting over issues of gender. I still remember when I went to seminary at Wycliffe College, which was a great school. Um, and in the final year, we had a young woman from Massachusetts who came to the school and uh, raised questions about our weekly worship in chapel. And she said, why do we always pray to God as father? She said, um, I never pray to God as father, but always as mother. And it threw the whole school into a big, huge brouhaha. Little did I know. That was 1981. Now, the last 40 years will be lived in a context in which we have been, as evangelicals, battling over issues of gender and uh, sexuality. Uh, to be honest, I think I'd rather live in the 18th century to be fighting over the Trinity. Uh, about two years ago, there was a bit of a brouhaha on the internet about the Trinity, and I thought, finally, we don't have to talk about sex and gender and we can talk about God, but um, we don't get a choice the day we live in. 
Uh, God gives us grace and we must, we must engage the battle where it is. And thank God for John Gill, who knew his day and knew that he had to engage the battle in the doctrine of the Trinity. As his successor, Charles Spurgeon would say, the coals of orthodoxy are essential to the fire of piety. That is such a great little statement. He makes that in a, in a book review. <laughs> but ever since I came across it, it's, it's lived in my mind. The coals of orthodoxy are essential to the fire of piety. When the United Church gave up orthodoxy, it really almost removed the possibility of revival. Gil, Gil's got some problems, which we'll look at. During his day, the churches are declining, but he held the line on the foundations. And the foundations were there so that in the next generation, men like Andrew Fuller could come along and pray for the outpouring of the spirit in revival. And those coals of orthodoxy were lit. But if the coals are taken away, what can be done? So we thank God for Gil. And uh, uh, a bit later in the term, a uh, term, <laughs> a bit later in this uh, course of lectures, we will, uh, we will see that there is an area which we would disagree with the great and good Dr. Gill. Any questions before we close? By the way, thank you. A couple of you sent remarks about last week. I deeply appreciate those. And uh, they didn't necessitate a response, but thank you for, for your encouragement. Dr. Haken, I've got a question. Yep, Terry. Um, I wish we could do this for the next three, four hours. Uh, <laughs> speaking about the Trinity in the 17th century, I know this wasn't mentioned about the, uh, the Blasphemy Act, where Scottish Parliament was yep. dealing, putting people punishment by death where, English, where the English were dealing with uh, civil penalties. Was this something that was exercised with any frequency back then? Like, were they really after this? Or No, by the 18th century, it was all gone by the boards. Because even, even in the Church of England, which they had the political power to enact uh, acts of blasphemy, they most, there was not one evangelical bishop in the Church of England till around the year 1800. Half of them themselves didn't believe in the Trinity. Even though they, they said it every week in the uh, Book of Common Prayer worship services. So there was, there was no will to enact those, those, th that legislation. But in the 18th century, 17th century, you're right, there were these various acts that, uh, against blasphemy. Because it wasn't the early 19th century, was the, what is it, the doctrine of the Trinity or the Trinitarian Act? Or, is that right? Yeah, that, that, that's the 17th. Yeah, by the 18th century, these things, they were still on the books, but nobody, nobody enforced them. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Aiken? Yep. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned uh, gender issues uh, near the end, and uh, I was, um, I realize, or uh, yeah, I've come to understand that among evangelicals, there seems to be some controversy on the issue of equality in the Trinity when it comes to the point of the son submitting or being under the father, where, um, where some people say that actually in all eternity, the son is kind of under the father and others say, no, that's a heresy. It's only during the time that uh, Jesus uh, basically voluntarily submitted to the father in his ministry on earth and that he was kind of reinstated, if you want, you know, when um, after his uh, ascension. Do, do you want to share something about that? Yes, I was going to say a little remark about that. The, the last text I have in the notes there, Isaac, is on uh, Gill's response to that argument and the issue of subordination. Uh, there have been, uh, first of all, I don't think it's heretical. I think it's wrong. Um, um, I don't believe in the eternal subordination of the Son. Um, I think the Son and the Holy Spirit are fully God, fully equal. They are not subordinate. I think that language is very dangerous language. I think it's the language that Jehovah's Witnesses kind of use. Uh, I have some 
I have a very good friend who would believe that. I don't think he's a radical, but I think he's wrong in his teaching. Um, it what this is the big. It was a big brouhaha two years ago on the internet, and actually when it started, I I was actually thankful. I thought I'm glad to stop having to think about gender and sex and think about the Trinity. Um, but uh, there are some evangelicals who I think wrongly understand passages like uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, where, G where Paul says the head of every man, of every woman is the man, and the head of the man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. Well, surely that's the incarnate son. Uh, and in his humanity, our Lord Jesus, uh, in the humanity of our Lord Jesus, he is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient, the humanity. He grows in wisdom. He says at one point of the second coming, no man knows, not even the son. But that's the humanity, not the deity. The deity has to know. He's fully God. He's, he shares the, the very being of God. And so one of the very important things, and this is why Christianity, as I said, it, it's not for dummies. And forgive me if you were offended by the remark I made, but it strikes me that Christianity is a, it's a difficult faith in some ways, uh, what we believe. And our beliefs are not irrational, but they are above human reason. And uh, in the incarnation, the eternal God, second person of the Godhead, who is omniscient, omnipresent. So when our Lord is dying on the cross, his deity is upholding the entire universe. There is no separation in being. And the Father is pouring out his wrath in salvific power upon the humanity, but he is still one in being with the Son. <laughs> Who can fathom this? Even if we were, even when we are in glory with perfect minds, I don't think we will fully understand these great mysteries, but we will worship and we will adore. I don't think the angels fully understand that. It talks about the angels longing to look into, I mean, to understand this, you'd have to be God to know the mind of God. <laughs> and he is infinite. I mean, these, I, these are fabulous truths. And um, if you want to see somebody who loves these truths, he's not part of the, the course of lectures, Charles Wesley. Mm -hmm. He loves to think about the Trinity in hymns. He loves to think about the incarnation and the resurrection in hymnody. And ultimately, and Gill is right, these things should lead us to worship. That we have such a great God who's infinitude and perfections exceed even our even our perfect mind to fully understand so that's the glory of eternity if you don't like learning <laughs> we will be forever learning and god forever our teacher i mean this is great for those of us who like school <laughs> i don't think i've ever heard uh, heaven described as an eternal school some of you are glad you got out, you know, I got, I've been out of this for 50 years, you're thinking, well, <laughs> that's why we have Sunday school, right? Trek is Sunday school. Anyway, Excellent. yeah, I, that, that's a very important question, uh, Isaac, and um, uh, there have been some very good books written in the past two or three years. Um, Scott Swain, Michael Allen, both of them Presbyterians at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary have written some really nice stuff. Um, on this issue. By the way, if you're interested in a book on gender, uh, I, I also have a little book on, on the Trinity. There, I have that one, okay. which I wrote, uh, Giving Glory to the Consubstantial Trinity. Oh. Um, on the issue of gender, Carl Truman uh, has spent five to seven years uh, writing a book on gender issues. Uh, really a very good book. So anyway, um, Maybe one last question, and then we will conclude with a word of prayer uh, at 7.15. I have a I have question. A, I have a... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Question about uh, 
This morning, when Pastor John was talking, he talked about Matthew 24, 36, where no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So that separates them, and that gets confusing to me. That's the humanity. It's got to be the humanity. Within the, within the incarnate Christ, there are two minds. Right? There is the human mind that we learn in Luke grows in wisdom. Okay. And then there is the... Written and, after he had died in Matthew, right? Yeah, I mean, Matthew's written uh, probably in the 60s. So it's written 30 years after his death and resurrection. Yep. So that's what's confusing me. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, in the humanity, I mean, that, that's written, but that's quoting a statement before the death and resurrection. But even so, I, the, when it was written doesn't make any change in the meaning. It, it obviously is Jesus is talking about in his humanity, Jesus does not know. But in his deity, he's one with the Father. There is only one mind in the Godhead. Yep. And one will. That's why at Gethsemane, it's the human will who says, not my will, but thy will be done. But in his deity, he's one will with the Father. That's why the whole idea of eternal subordination is problematic. Because it assumes that within the Godhead, there are three wills, but there's only one will. If you really want to get technical, the, <clears throat> the will is tied to nature. One divine being, one God, one will. In the humanity of Jesus, it's right, in the incarnation, we have two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, and they both have a will. And they both have a mind. Okay. The incarnation has no, there's no analogy in creation. This is really, this is difficult material. And you can see, we see why some people like Jehovah's Witnesses or Muslims or Mormons, Mormons are tritheists who just say, let's just give up on this. And no, this is, this is the glory of our faith. And we shouldn't expect anything different. That this challenges us, our minds. And some of the greatest theologians in the history of the church have spent their lives thinking about this. I don't know, if the, I, I hope, if, if you want, I, I, I'm happy to continue the conversation, Ron, uh, but that's the way I would explain that, that issue, that it's the humanity that does not know the second coming, but the deity must. Yep, thank you. Well, um, let me close with a word of prayer. Next week, I want to come back to hymnody, but I want to come back and I won't go over the same ground, obviously. I want to look at the life of a woman named Anne Steele. And if this was 1900, you'd all know Anne. In fact, we might've sung one of her hymns uh, in worship in the past week or two. Um, her hymns were the fifth largest number of hymns in the typical Baptist hymnal. Uh, I want to talk about her life and how God used um, tragedy to some degree. She had a lot of ill health to produce great fruitfulness uh, in her life. And we'll look at probably three or four of her hymns. And one of the things I'm going to bring out is that the importance of, uh, of hymns expressing lament. Um, about a third of the psalms are lament psalms and I, I sometimes think that we don't have room for lament in our worship and uh, we'll see how Anne Steele brings that out uh, as she reflects on her life and puts it into, into hymnody and we'll also see how our hymnody will be a vehicle of revival and how important that is well let me close in a, in a word of prayer our gracious God we thank you that you are Father and Son and Spirit, and that this is a truth we gladly affirm, and we worship you as Father, Son, and Spirit, yet we confess it escapes our minds to fully understand. We thank you for John Gill, for his life and for his witness in his day, for your use of him, for 
uh, to maintain orthodoxy in your churches and how that brought blessing ultimately. We pray that you would help us to know uh, where to stand in our day, to stand fast on the truths that you have given us in Holy Scripture. And we pray now your blessing upon each represented here, upon our families, uh, upon uh, our witness this week. Uh, keep us in your peace and grant us peace. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Every blessing. Look forward to seeing you in a week. Thank you.